Hi, I'm Kiana Danielle, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. Have you ever worried about losing it all? My father-in-law didn't. The year was 1979. He was thriving in Iran as an upper middle class CFO of his company. It afforded him and his young family a very comfortable life. But with the overthrow of a political regime, he was branded because of the leanings of his company's owner and thrown in jail. His escape, or shall I say release, his jailers were friendly to the old regime, provided him with an opportunity. A short time later, he and his family arrived in the United States with a few thousand dollars and the clothes on their backs. It would take many decades to accumulate even a modicum of the wealth they had enjoyed previously. My guest today has a similar story from the same part of the world. Her parents' wealth quickly became a victim of the same forces that drove my wife's family on that plane headed to America. Both stories remind us that fortunes are delicate. They sway with political winds as well as financial. While you may be fortunate to live and hopefully thrive in a much less politically volatile environment that won't protect you from the myriad risks that threaten to derail your best laid financial plans. The experts whisper that a recession is coming. A bubble may soon burst. Will you be ready? How? Kiana Danyal is the CEO of Invest Diva. She's an award-winning personal finance and generational wealth expert. Her mission is to help at least 1 million moms take control of their financial future by increasing their income and investing. Kiana, welcome to Earn and Invest. Everyone is talking right now about the new year, 2022. Could this be the year the big recession hits? Thank you for having me. And timing the recession, in my opinion, is not very wise because nobody is Nostradamus, not even Warren Buffett. (laughs) But planning for a recession is an incredibly wise idea. So I never know when a recession could happen, but we know that historically, every eight to 20 years, sometimes a recession will happen. And that's not a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing and can open up a lot of opportunities for wealth transfer to people who didn't previously have wealth. But if you do have wealth, you definitely want to protect it. Yeah, we've had a pretty good run for the last 10 years, haven't we? 100%. So that's why experts and people who just study the history are worried or warning about a recession is just because what goes up must come down. We cannot just have continuous good years. We know that we are due for a pullback. And we had a mini one beginning of COVID, which is amazing for a lot of people who are prepared, not knowing what's going to cause it, but knowing that it is going to happen. And because they were prepared, they made a ton of money. Others, not so much. But if you didn't make money in the 2020 recession or the pullback, then now it's your chance. I love this idea that the recession can be a chance to really create new wealth for people who haven't had it before. I want to get back to that in a little bit, but first let's discuss your background a little bit. In my intro, I talked about my father-in-law and my wife's family My father-in-law tells a story about boarding the plane to leave Iran to come to the U.S. He and his wife had had a pact that if they had gotten stopped and if he was detained, that the rest of them would go on to America. That didn't happen. But the next day, one of his associates tried to leave the country, was detained, and they never heard from him again. These were difficult times. Tell us about what happened to your family. They were absolutely difficult times. I wasn't born right at the beginning. I was born five years later. But similarly to your father-in-law, my dad also had a very successful company. He was managing about 2,000 people. And my family was living a good upper middle class life. And when the revolution happened, the government was actually going to kill my dad. And he lucked out. And the lucky thing about that was that the person that was going to sign his execution turned out to be his buddy from his military days back in the day. So the guy told him, okay, I'm not going to kill you, but 
like just stay low and don't do anything. They did freeze all of his assets. So they didn't have anything, but they also took away their passports, which meant they couldn't leave the country. Now, there were a lot of Iranians who left the country regardless. They got smuggled out or different routes. And that's how they sent my brother, who was 16 at the time. So I was, so they, they sent my brother, but my dad kind of had his head get big because he didn't uh, get killed. So he decided to actually stay and sue the new government. So he (laughs) stayed. They had me. They were actually getting somewhere with their lawsuit. But um, then the leader of Iran at the time, Khomeini, died and the lawsuit, the case got lost and they continued just not having anything. And so... It is interesting because they had to, again, rebuild their lives in Iran within that with that situation. And then my brother being at this side of the world and then the rest of our family, all my aunts, uncles, grandparents. I didn't see any of them when I was born because they had all left. So I grew up with absolutely no relatives. And then eventually now we're all here after years and years and years. But it is an interesting story to tell in a sense. I can attribute a lot of the success mentality that I've had to the stories that I've learned from my dad, because it was basically a cautionary tale that people thought the good years are going to continue and everything is just fabulous, rainbows and unicorns. And then boom, out of nowhere, something comes that you never could have predicted. And this could happen to any country. Like we've seen all these major empires falling. And when I look at America, unfortunately, even though it has been the land of my dreams, my dream came true here, but I actually see some resemblance to what caused the revolution in my country. And I'm a little bit fearful, to be honest. And that's why I am trying to make sure that I don't make any other mistakes that my dad did so that if and when something happens, we as a family can thrive. It's interesting because it sounds like your parents decided to send your brother out of the country. And then they eventually made the decision that based on the trauma and what they had gone through, that they wanted to send you out to you went to Japan as an 18 year old. Well, that was actually different. No. So they decided to send my brother because Iran got into the war with Iraq And they were recruiting young boys to go and participate in the war. So they did not want that to happen. So that's why they sent him. Me going to Japan was completely different because I grew up in Iran not knowing the, you know, not having experienced that luxury life. So I was like, okay, this is life. And I was fine. And I actually consider my teenagers pretty normal, which is weird now that like, oh my God, you went to, (laughs) as a Jewish girl, you went to school in Iran and you pretended you're not Jewish. You don't get killed. Yeah. But it was like, fine. I had fun and I wasn't actually planning to leave Iran. And the Japan thing I thought is going to be a temporary thing. I got a scholarship. I thought I'm going to go only for six months. My dad was like, no, don't go. My mom was like, okay, it's just an experience. And I left and then I fell and I suddenly saw this whole new developed world. I'm like, oh my gosh, what have I been missing out on? So I decided to stay in Japan and my parents were heartbroken and that six months turned into seven years. So that was not really because of what happened. That was just incident, accident, (laughs) accidentally went to Japan. Now that I look back, uh, I kind of do regret that decision because the things that I studied in Japan I'm not no longer using, and I could have just come directly to America, which in my opinion is far more suitable for somebody who has entrepreneurial ambitions. Japan is not the place for that, but it is interesting. However, my life turned out, but coming to America, then that was like the beginning of my new chapter. That is what I've been doing for the past 10 years and has really shaped who am I, who I am and my family and bringing my family out of Iran event finally and all the good stuff. So everything happens for a reason. And we're here talking about fi- money now. Let's talk about Japan for a moment, because it, it's an interesting story. And to me, at least from what I've heard, leads to your story to America. You went to Japan to study engineering 
somehow ended up being in a talk show there and eventually started trading currency. How did you go from engineer to currency trader? So you being married to a Persian woman, you probably know the pressure that Iranians put on their children to either become a doctor, engineer, or lawyer. So that pressure was definitely on me as well. I couldn't become a doctor because I just faint at a sight of blood. So that was out of question. And engineering was just kind of decided for me because my dad was an engineer. And I was like, all right, so I'm going to go become an engineer because I can't become a doctor. I have to become something. And I hated it. <laughs> and I was not good at it. And the, the problem was that not only was engineering, it was electrical engineering in Japanese. That was a language that I was learning as I was learning English. And just all of them combined, it was, I was just looking for an outlet. So the talk show opportunity came across in our college that we're recruiting some foreigners to talk about Japan's social issues. And my, my Japanese had gotten well enough at that point that I could participate so that came along. And then being on the talk show, I learned about money and a recession. And I was like, what is happening? What is a recession? Who are banks? I didn't know any of these things. I was not literate financially at all. And that kind of also some of my friends who were trading currencies kind of encouraged me to take advantage of the 2008 recession. So what happened at the time was that I had some I had accumulated some Japanese yen because I was on the talk show. And the 2008 recession happened and I learned that the US dollar is losing its value to the Japanese yen because Japanese yen is a quote unquote safe haven. And that was something that I understood because being a foreigner you always understand exchange rates because when you go back to a different country, to your country or go to another country at the airport, you change your currency. And then when you go and come back and the exchange rate has changed, you either have gained money or lost money. So that language was the only thing that I understood. And I was like, okay, now that the US dollar is getting cheaper, maybe I should like buy some US dollar because it's on sale. And I was talking about this to some of the people who were there. And the, one of my friends said, yes, you can actually do it on leverage and make a bunch of money. And I didn't understand anything that they said, but I was like, okay, let's do it. And I did it. And I made $10,000 during the market crash in 2008. And I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> this is what I want to do. I don't want to do engineering. I want to do finance. And also on the talk show, I learned that because of the recession, the governments are printing money, which means inflation is coming. And if you need to be investing in order to combat the inflation, I was learning all these things and I was becoming fascinated about finance. So that is when I decided to leave my whole life that I had built in Japan for seven years and go to the heart of global finance on Wall Street. And so, yeah, me coming to America wasn't me running away from the Iranian regime, it was me just pursuing financial literacy, which turned out pretty well, clearly. And it turned out pretty well. You've built up Investiva, but there were some roadblocks on the way. You describe it being a year into New York. You had the dream job. You lived in the dream apartment. You had a boyfriend. And then it all fall up, fell apart within like a week or two what happened, first of all? And second of all, did your parents' experiences in Iran and the trauma they dealt with financially affect how you then managed that hurdle in New York when all of a sudden it kind of fell apart on you? Great question. So to answer your first question, I got fired and my boyfriend dumped me and I didn't have money to pay rent. So that all happened right after I had finally achieved my quote unquote dream. And my family's trauma, it kind of was, it kind of felt like a repetition of what they went through because they had achieved financial freedom right before the revolution. And my dad asked, so they didn't come from wealth. My dad built his wealth and then it was taken away from him. And then when the same thing happened to me, I was like, okay, 
great. Like the same thing is happening to me. So yeah, absolutely. Like I saw history kind of repeating itself and I was like, okay, I need to break the cycle of achieving success, achieving, getting, gaining money and then losing all of it. And I wanted to make sure that I don't do, don't make the mistakes that my parents made and yeah, break the cycle so that I can create a legacy that is recession proof, hopefully. So we'll see. So let's talk about that a little bit. You're in the midst of everything falling apart. This is always the time where most people listening are really listening closely, right? Because they want to know what exactly do you do when that happens? Take yourself back to New York. Everything's falling apart. How do you stem the flow of all this disaster? Like, do you remember what the first step you took to kind of make things start getting better? So it was a dark place. I remember (laughs) the first time I took was not telling people I got fired because my ego was super bruised. (laughs) It was like, I quit people. I did not get fired. (laughs) So I was very, and then when I got dumped again, my ego was, it was a lot of challenges with my own ego. So it took me a good, I want to say six months for me to actually come to acceptance to what had happened and then wanting to take control of my own life. Because for the first six months, I was grieving. I was blaming the boss. I was blaming my boyfriend. I was blaming my family for not having, I was blaming all these people, right? And I think there are like cycles in grief. And like when you lost, I mean, it wasn't like, it, it, it is weird to call it grief, but it, it, it kind of also feels like it. It's not like I lost a very per, in, important person in my life. I mean, I did, but it does feel like grief, right? So I had to go through the cycles and then I had to make that decision, like having this aha moment that, okay, I'm repeating what my parents went through and I want to be in control. Like I'm tired of being the victim because all I heard growing up was my parents clearly blaming the Iranian government for all of the misfortune and always being the victim. Like, oh, we were this good and this happened and always repeating the sob stories. And it feels natural. That felt natural to me that you always want to blame somebody. It came to a point that I was like, no longer. One of the things that did help uh, was the secret. I don't know if you, you or your audience have watched but that really got me to want to be in charge of my own life. And that is when I decided to, okay, I don't have a job. I don't have a boyfriend. Nobody's getting, nobody's proposing to me. So I'm going to create Investiva and my logo is going to be a diamond because nobody's proposing to me. (laughs) So I gave myself a diamond. (laughs) So that's how the logo was designed. It's an interesting point, this idea of both acceptance and letting go of this sense of victimhood. How did you know you could do it on your own? Like a lot of people say, okay, I'm going to get an investment advisor or, okay, I'm going to find help. How did you know that this was something that you innately could do by yourself? Oh, because I got burnt by money managers and I worked on Wall Street. So the job that I got fired from was on Wall Street. So I was aware of the shady things that happen on Wall Street. And also, oh, so one thing that I didn't talk about was when I was in Japan and I learned that investing is the way to go when recessions happen. And I was like, okay, I don't know. Okay, I got lucky. I made $10,000 in the currency exchange, but I don't know how to invest. I don't know what stocks are. I don't know anything. So I did the next best thing that any logical person would do, which is hiring a financial advisor. And this person found me on LinkedIn and was like, hey, We do these things for foreigners in Japan. We invest our money in a mutual fund. I didn't know what a mutual fund is. And then he explained to me that it's going to like compound and all the good stuff. And I didn't understand a word that he said. And he, but it was like, this sounds amazing. Yes, let's do it. And he got me a contract to sign, which was like 50 pages. I clearly didn't read it. And I just signed like, yes, take my money, compound it. I want to become a millionaire. And so what happened was that my money was there even after I came to America and when I got fired from my job, I was like, okay, I don't have money anymore. I want to go and get my money out of that money manager's account. And I was like, hey guys, I have an emergency. I need my money back. And they said, oh yeah, this was a 25 year deal. If you want to take it out early, you have to pay a 75% penalty, Mm. (laughs) which made meant that 
at that point, I think the money had grown to a hundred thousand dollars, which meant I would get only fifteen thousand dollars, which would barely pay for like five months of rent. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So that was a burn on top of the burn of getting fired and learning about all the shady things that brokers do on, on Wall Street that, you know, with retail traders and all the things. So I knew the insight of Wall Street on how they're screwed over retail investors. And then I had personally been burnt by a completely separate money manager in the UK. So I was like, okay, this is global. Like money managers do not have your best interest at heart. So I want to teach people to do it on their own. So I did go and study for the CFP, which is Certified Financial Planning. But then instead of actually becoming a financial advisor, I decided not to claim my title because for me to claim my title, I would have had to go back and work at a broker. So instead of that, I was like, okay, I'm going to just teach everything that I learned to normal people and make it easy for them to understand. Because the books that you have to learn to become sort of a financial planner, like normal people wouldn't want to spend that time going through. So that is my whole Investiva movement, which is like, I've broken down all the essential things that you need to learn in order to become your own financial advisor so that you can take control of your own money within eight weeks. Knowing what you know today, something as big as CFP studying probably isn't necessary, right? I mean, a lot of people look at these either degrees or certifications and think that's what they need to manage their own money. But actually, a lot of that is really for people who want to advise other people and to teach you all the compliance and the rules, et cetera. (laughs) It is to keep it a monopoly. Oh, I'm a CFB. I have the title. You got to be intimidated by me because I'm a You're a doctor. (laughs) I mean, okay, let me put it this way. Becoming a CFB is nowhere as hard as becoming a doctor. I mean, it is essential, but they didn't have to make it this hard to learn because majority of it is actually common sense about money. Like these things should be taught at high school. So as you're going through the CFP program, they do add these really unnecessary math things that you have to solve in order to become a CFP that, again, you have the best calculator in the world on your iPhone. Like you don't actually need to sit down and resolve those problems. So don't make it unnecessarily hard for people to become CFPs. And then they are obligated to work for brokers because they want to provide for their families. And then the CFP title gives them a status that kind of separates them from the regular people. And then the regular people are intimidated and also look up at the CFPs and think they cannot do it themselves, right? So it's just a vicious circle. I'm not saying like CFPs are like bad people. It's just the system is designed so that people are not incentivized to manage their own money because if they manage their own money, the CFPs will go out of business, right? It is not rocket science. It is not surgery. Like, no, it's it's common sense. <laughs> We are talking to Kiana Danyal. She is the CEO of Invest Diva and an award-winning personal finance and generational wealth expert. We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest Podcast. All around the world, tech companies are innovating and driving returns for investors. Our crowd analyzes companies across the global private market, selecting those with the greatest growth potential, then brings them to you. From personalized medicine to health tech, which is tackling the $60 billion global IVF and fertility treatment market, our crowd is identifying innovators so you can invest when growth potential is greatest early. Our crowd is the fastest growing venture capital investment community. Their accredited investors have already invested over $1 billion in growing tech companies. Now you can invest in Future Family, who's providing millions of families with access to affordable treatment through buy now, pay later financing. Future Family powers 15% of the U.S. fertility's clinics. Last year, they grew patients served by 300%. Invest today at our crowd. Invest in Future Family at OURCROWD.com slash EAI. You can join our crowd for free at OURCROWD.com slash EAI. Join the fastest growing venture capital investments community at ourcrowd.com slash E 
A I. Kiana Daniel is the CEO of Invest Diva. Her mission is to help at least 1 million moms take control of their financial future by increasing their income and investing. Kiana, the real reason today to have this conversation is this idea of what to do in a recession. Can you recession proof your wealth? You can attempt. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to say there is like this massive one size fit all solution. But to my understanding, basically not putting all your eggs in one basket is the gist of recession proofing. So I'll give you an example, what I learned from my dad. So the reason why my dad had to go back to absolute zero was because all the money that he was earning from his business, he was putting back in the business. He was not diversifying out of, outside of the country because he believed in the regime at the time because you know everything was great before the revolution and because everything was going back in his bank account or in his company, which was very easy for the Iranian government to come and seize, right? So learning from that, how I am recession-proofing or actually disaster-proofing my portfolio is diversification. That's all it is. And how you diversify is basically diversifying your assets in categories that are not correlated, right? So for example, what happens when there is a recession? And this, by the way, brings up something that may piss some people off. I don't like investing in index funds for that very reason. So an index fund, you go and buy a basket of all the companies, right? Some companies do significantly better during recession. Companies that sell stuff cheaper, like McDonald's, Walmart, right? So when a recession happens, these companies are going higher. Whereas other companies that could come back after a recession are dropping. Now, a very interesting strategy that Warren Buffett does is that you want to be, you want to become a value investor. What is value investing? Is buying assets that are currently undervalued and have future growth. So how we were able to have this massive success during the COVID-19 pandemic when the markets dropped was that I already knew the list of the companies that I know knew are going to make a comeback regardless of what's going to happen with the pandemic. And as they were dropping and as everybody was panic selling, I went and bought those companies. And then at that time, at that very time, there were companies that were going up because they were directly correlated to the, to the pandemic, like Moderna and all these stocks. And I actually didn't, I missed out on the first round. I was like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to buy the ones that are already high. I'm going to buy that are low. And that turned out very, very well for my, for my portfolio. So that is one thing, one reason why I think you should kind of be on top of what you're investing in and kind of going against the crowd. Another way you want to diversify is clearly not putting all of your assets in one country and also not pulling all your assets in the, in the, in the, in the stocks. If you're investing in stocks, not putting them all in the stocks of one country or in the same category, which is the reason why I also invest in cryptocurrencies. Because as I was learning about Bitcoin, for example, the, I was not a fan of Bitcoin for the longest time. I heard about it in 2011. One of my advisors told me, my, my friend's advisor is not actual financial advisor, told me, hey, go buy Bitcoin in 2011. No, this is way too risky for me. I don't want to buy it. But then in 2016, when I learned about the fact that it is decentralized, that any government can't really go and like freeze it because it's on a blockchain, it's peer to peer. I was like, oh my gosh, if my dad had had a fraction of his wealth in Bitcoin, he didn't have to start from zero. He would have had something. So that's why 25% of my, of my assets is in cryptocurrency. Also, I don't only invest in the financial assets. I have multiple revenue streams, revenue streams just from side hustles, becoming an affiliate marketer for somebody else. If you have a nine to five job, that is one revenue stream, but it's not enough. What happens if you get fired? Like I did, right? So I try to have investments, in different categories that are uncorrelated. And that is how I, quote unquote, recession-proof, government shutdown-proof 
revolution proof, all the things proof my wealth. So there's a lot to unpack there. I want to hit on a few ideas. First and foremost, value investors, right? This idea, buy when something is under value, hold it and sell when it goes up. It sounds great, but we know from money managers, et cetera, that that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. So first and foremost, can your average Joe and Jane out there acquire enough knowledge to understand what is a value and when? Yes, because the average Joe and Jane out there shops on Black Friday, they identify sales. If you can identify a sale... (laughs) For the stuff that you love, you can identify the same. Like, don't look at stocks at this, like, oh my gosh, it's just this financially crazy mathematical thing. The reason why stocks go up is because they're providing some sort of value to other people. And the best place to start, in fact, is investing in companies that you already know and are a consumer of. Because if there's a company there, like, okay, there's no way on earth that I'm going to go to their competitor, there is a reason for that. And if you just learn the basics of fundamental analysis and thinking outside the box, learning to think for yourself, then not only you're able to identify the companies that have value, if they have value for you, there is a very good reason why chance that they have value for other consumers. And also, if you love them, don't you want to support their their business? So it's like, it's actually, I I feel like it's a moral obligation for the um, economic well-being that people select their own assets because you can vote with your money, any company that you invest in. So there are companies that are doing well, they have tremendous earnings, but you may hate their CEO and you may think that everything that they're doing goes against your morality. If you invest in an index fund, you don't get to have that say. If you're investing with a financial advisor, you can't tell that person, hey, I don't want to invest in this company because they're like, oh, I have the whole thing planned out. Like, don't do this. But you can actually, if you understand what you're doing and it takes like literally just basics of understanding how businesses work, you don't have to go and read earnings or spreadsheets. You just have to understand, think out of the box and see, is this company providing value is this helping the humanity in any shape or form? Is this helping us do things better, faster, cheaper? Do I want to support this company? Is this company going to be around in the next five to 10 years? Is this company flexible with the changes that are thrown at them? And if you answer those questions and you have a good feeling about it, you can support them by investing in them. And in turn, gain right on the growth. So what you're talking about is a much more qualitative analysis as opposed to a quantitative. So I know a lot of us really get exhausted by this idea that we have to go and look at a company's financials and have to understand their earning reports and all those type of things. You seem to be saying that, no, maybe we should really be thinking about these bigger qualitative decisions. 100%, because the earnings report are just misleading. They are rigged kind of because, so this is what happens with earnings, right? So the company's board of directors come and have, they say, hey, we have like this kind of expectation for our next quarter earnings. And they normally bring it lower. And then the speculators and say, oh, because of this and this and that, they're going to have a higher uh, higher earnings report. And then they trade based on the expected earnings announced earnings. And then once the earnings actually out, the market has already priced it in. And it's just a completely different game that you do not have to play. The hedge funds that can't outperform the S&P, those are the ones. I'm not telling you to say, think, oh my gosh, oh, I have to go be stuck to my screen all day. I have to like analyze all the markets. No, to the contrary. I only manage my, my portfolio once a month. I know the top companies that I always want to invest in and they're directly correlated to my credit card, which means every company that I I spend the most with for my personal or business consumptions are the companies that I have the the higher amount of shares in my portfolio and the allocation. Basically, what I do is I go back and see, okay, has the prices dropped? I already know the fundamentals. I already know that this company is is, is, is aligned with my idea of value investing. 
and you can apply to the cryptocurrencies, by the way, as well. And if it's prices dropped, I'll buy more or I set buy limit orders to buy more while I'm not around and doing other things. And that's it. I only spend an hour per week to do that. I do not think reading the earnings, I, I think it's absolutely stupid because you know the biggest companies now, they were not having any earnings for years and years and years. If you were doing quantitative analysis at the time, you wouldn't have invested in those companies because of that reason, which would have been a bad investment, right? So I, I, I look at definitely qualitative qualities of companies before I invest in. The old refrain is don't try to time the market, right? Because then you got to figure out when to buy and then you got to figure out when to sell. And people get tripped up with those decisions. That doesn't sound like what you're saying. It sounds like you're saying do it intelligently, but you should be able to time the market to some extent. So timing the market for me, it's not like I'm waiting for it to drop. If it's an asset that I really want to have in my portfolio, I buy it there and then I just do dollar cost averaging. But also by doing technical analysis, I mitigate my risk in a sense that I set buy limit orders just in case. And if I feel like this asset is due for a pullback, because every asset, it, not, nothing can ever just go up. Every asset is due for a pullback at some point. So, and because I don't want to be stuck to my screen all day, I analyze the market. I identify those key psychological levels that the markets are, the markets move because of market psychology. So if you understand the market psychology, you can just identify the key psychological levels that that asset could drop to. And I set the buy limit orders. If it drops, I buy more, which is great. And I don't have to be there. If it doesn't drop, I've already bought some at the market price anyway. So it is just a way of risk mitigation for me so that I don't miss out on the pullbacks and I don't have to be stuck on my screen all day. Does that make sense? But as I said, if it's an asset that I really want in my portfolio, you can just go ahead and do dollars cost averaging. The w- Buying low and selling high is a method of compounding that that is the real timing the market that is exhausting and majority of people get emotional and cannot outperform the index funds. I do my compounding differently which is again, a way of my diversification, I compound by increasing my income and then contributing that income every single month on the clock to my portfolio. There are a few important points there. One that I think we should be really clear about is when you have the ability to decide what you think the value of a stock, a piece of company is, then putting out those preset buy and sell orders makes life a lot easier, right? Because it's already set and you've put in some risk mitigation and some protection there such that you'll either take profits or take losses, but you'll know exactly what your levels are based on what you think that stock is valued. So I think that's a really good way of going about it. Talk to me a little more about diversification. We've been talking about equities and we've been talking about crypto but there are all sorts of other types of investments. There are alternative investments. There's real estate. How do you decide what percentages of your portfolio should be each? So there are 100 ways to go from New York to LA. And I'm not exposed to all kinds of investments. I'm exposed to the type of investments that I've learned about, I've educated myself on, and feel the most enjoyable and natural to me. So yes, real estate is a great form of diversification. It's just something that I'm not interested in. I cannot see myself going and finding the real estate and renovating the house and flipping it and all the good things that a lot of, there's a lot of money in there, but it's just not for me. So don't think that just because I'm doing my investment this way, you have to do the same thing. I my form of diversification is actually investing in myself. <laughs> so learning a new skill is a huge part of my diversification because skills are something that no government, no recession can take away from you. And if you have stacked up enough skills, you can find a way to make money no matter what the situation is. So there are skills that I have that I've never used. Like I play the piano very well. I am a double black diamond skier. Like I've never made money off of those. But if my business goes bankrupt and I have nothing else to do, maybe I'll go and teach skiing. Who knows, right? So (laughs) learning skills 
And high income producing skills is a big part of my investment. I invest in new coaches almost every month and learn something new that I know that is correlated to something that can produce income for me. And I also invest in my side hustles and in my business. Now that I have a proven form of creating revenue through my online side hustles, I do invest in those. I do invest in the marketing there. So it is not just investing. I do want to point this out that I didn't go from zero to $5 million just by investing in the financial assets, in the cryptocurrency market, just by having this massive, great stocks. I did have some great performances in my portfolio, but only investing in the financial assets will take you to the million dollar point, but it's going to be very slow and it's going to be very stressful if it's not your day job, if day trading is not your normal, some people enjoy it, I don't. So I put all of that passion into my business. I increase my income and I on the clock contribute all a portion, like the portion that I've dedicated to my investments every single month to my portfolio. And that's why it's compounding at an accelerated rate. People often forget that when you're looking at diversification, you can look at stocks and bonds and real estate, but the business asset class is a very good asset class. And unlike other asset classes, when you take money and you put it in the stock market, you take money and you put it in real estate, that money is kind of consumed by those assets. Whereas you can start working on the business asset class without any equity to start with, except sweat equity, which is something that a lot of us have. Kiana, I could see people listening to this conversation right now, some naysayers, and they'd say, you know what, Kiana, you started making money off the back of the 2008 recession, and this has been a fantastic 12 or 13 years. You've never been through a recession. What do you say to those people who kind of doubt some of how you're hypothesizing we should get through this? Because these have been really good years. I mean, a lot of us have done well. Well, I can't wait for a recession. (laughs) (laughs) I can't wait for the market to drop and some of these buy limit orders of mine that haven't gone through for a while to finally go through. But also, obviously, I know that if there is a recession in the financial markets, then my business may also get hurt. So it's not like that's what I'm preparing myself for precisely. And so let me tell you this, though. My portfolio performed very well at the beginning. No, actually not at the beginning. I had some, I had some bumps in the road when I was at the beginning, when I was reporting from New Stock Exchange. But then I lost a lot of my money again and I came back in and I decided to do value investing. And I started with 500 bucks per month. So I was contributing 500 bucks per month. And over three years, that portfolio only grew to $50,000. Now that is an exceptional performance starting from 500 bucks. But the matter of the fact is $50,000 will barely pay for a down payment of the house of a house. It is a great performance, but it's not a million dollar status. So as I was playing around with the numbers, I was like, oh my gosh, if I had contributed, let's go crazy. What if, what if I had contributed $500,000 per month to this portfolio at this rate of increase, at this rate of performance, that would have turned into $50 million over three years, much better than $50,000. So what I would love to encourage your listeners to ask themselves when they come come up with doubts is that instead of saying this is not possible or it worked for her, but it's not going to work for me, or I'm lost my, my, I missed my opportunity, or she's just lucky, or there are a million excuses that you can come up with. I would like to encourage your listeners to ask themselves empowering questions. Instead of saying this is not going to work, or she just got lucky, ask yourself, how can I make it work for me? with my situation. Because the moment you ask yourself how your brain is going to shift its perspective from 
trying to look for all the excuses and whatever you believe, by the way, your brain is going to justify it. So if you think this is not going to be possible for you, it's not going to be possible for you. But if you ask, ask how, then your brain is going to look for answers. So when I ask myself, how can I contribute $500,000 to my portfolio per month? And that conditioned my brain to go look for solutions and looking at income increasing solutions instead of just investing in the financial assets, instead of just piggybacking on other company successes, which is what you do essentially when you invest in the stock market. I was like, oh my gosh, if I could get my business to create $500,000, and I know that's a big number. I didn't start there clearly, but it conditioned my brain to look for those solutions, to look for the people who've done that and learn from them. And yeah, it took me a while to get there, but I did. And now, yes, I do contribute actually not $500,000 per month yet, but it's $200,000 per month, which is great, which is amazing. Every time the market, there is a pullback there, I'm there, I'm buying all the assets. And I know that in five years time, in 10 years time, this is going to be to my benefit. So ask yourself how. So you just said, ask yourself how in my situation, I can contribute more Invest Diva focuses at least somewhat on moms. In fact, you say you want to help at least 1 million moms make their finances stronger. What are the hurdles for moms today? Why is it different for them? So the reason why I'm passionate about helping moms, it's because, well, I am a mom. I have a sister who's a mom. I have a mom who's a mom. And I have a lot of stay-at-home moms who think that this is it for them. At the beginning, when they have their kids, they feel helpless. They're under a lot of pressure. And the last thing they want to think about is money. But unfortunately, or fortunately, women live longer. And for us not to be in charge of our finances can have a very, very expensive impact in our retirement years. That is one reason. The next reason is that once our kids leave our houses, which I see like my sister, like my mom, we have no other purpose anymore, right? There are so so many different reasons why that I'm passionate about helping moms, these two being, being the biggest ones. But that being said, we do have a huge community of all people of all sorts, because obviously personal finance, financial literacy is not just for moms. It's just moms was something that People didn't even see moms as becoming investors. In fact, when I started and I announced that I'm here to help moms take control of their financial future, I got a massive backlash from some of the other, some gurus in the financial literacy space who created videos about me calling me the scum of earth because I'm targeting these innocent moms and getting them into investing, which is super high risk. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I I don't teach people day trading. I don't teach people anything that is, I teach people risk management. That's really actually really what I do. Risk management and taking control of your own financial future. But we do have a huge group of dads, non-dads, dog moms, cat dads, all all (laughs) kinds of people. Anybody who is supportive of our mission is welcome in our community. But my personal goal is to help moms because I think there are, a group of people that need this help the most. Well, Kiana, I wanted to thank you for coming on the show today. When I think about our fears of recession, our fears of the future, it brings me back to your parents' story and my father-in-law's story. And I think one of the hardest things probably for all of them was the powerlessness. And so your message really resonates with me because what you're saying is, well, you can't control the future. We don't know when a government is going to be overthrown. We don't know what's going to happen in the stock market or in the business world. But what we do know is that we can plan ahead, we can diversify, and we can do the best that we can to approach these things from a sense of power. And I think if we do that, we have the best chance of being successful I wanted to end this episode the way end every episode by asking you what is up next in your life. And if people want to learn more, where can they find you? So first and foremost, what is coming up with you and Investiva? So we just published my fifth book, which is Million Dollar Family Secrets that we just achieved the bestseller status. We're super excited about that. 
what is coming up next for the Investiva movement is, well, my goal is to reach and help at least 1 million moms by the year 2025. So that is what we're going to be focusing the most of our energy on, coming up with strategies to reach as many moms as possible. The book was one way, but so that is, that's what we're planning on. And personally, we're also planning on having another kid. So we're super excited about that as well. How people can find us, you can find, oh, please don't fall for my impersonators on social media. (laughs) There are so many of them. The best way to go is just to go to the Invest Diva website, or you can search my name on Amazon and check out one of our, one of my five books. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast on behalf of myself, Doc G. I'd like to thank Kiana Danielle, the Invest Diva. That's a wrap. Hey, everybody. Just a little update on our ground team. The ground team is a chance for you, an Earn and Invest listener, to become part of my team for my book launch of Taking Stock. That's going to be during the first week of August. We already have almost 100 participants. If you sign up to be part of the ground team, you are going to get extra video. You're going to get snapshots into the book early. And you're going to get other content and blogs. Become part of this community. Help me get this book out. Again, we're starting early because the ground team needs to be in place by early August. I hope you check it out. Just go to earnandinvest.com and right up at the top of the page, there'll be a place for you to learn more about the ground team. Come become part of the Earn and Invest and Taking Stock team. Thanks for listening. Awesome. Do you have any questions? Anything you feel like we didn't talk about that you would have liked to talk about? Um, no, but I'm, I'm curious, where do you live? <laughs> I live in Evanston, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. It's where Northwestern is. Wow, super cool. Yeah, so my, my wife's parents came to the U.S. in 79 um, and stayed here. They lived in Arlington Heights, which is down the road, and, um, and struggled. Did did well. My my father in law eventually bought a building, which he managed like twenty unit building, which ended up you know certainly improving their economic fortunes hugely. Um, but the story resonates with me because I think it's 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 tough. And um, of course, someone like you should be talking about what how we should manage the next recession. I mean, that's in your DNA, right? That's that's your experience. Yeah. Wow. No, this is great. Thank you so much for inviting me on the podcast. Can't wait to, if you can just let let us know when it's out, we can promote it on our, with our audience as well. Yeah, I will. um, So a few days before it comes out, I'll edit it up and I will send it to you so you can listen to it. Uh, And then I'll give you like shareable links and all that the day before. So you guys will know, and I'll send it both to you and to the, to your assistant. I think I have in your, in the email. Yep in the email. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for doing this. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Had a lot of fun. Say hi to your wife. Have a good one. (laughs) Take care. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.